Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast, where we talk about things that matter at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum counselor and teacher, intuitive guide, author and podcaster, and above all, an inquisitive soul. This show is about how we can bring the various spiritual, metaphysical, and esoteric concepts and ancient wisdom validated by quantum physics and modern cosmology to the very practical level to improve and enrich our life experience as individuals, communities, and the humankind. My intention for this podcast is to be engaging, educational, empowering, and fun, but it may also surprise or even shock you as we venture into deep rabbit holes and out on a limb as far as we can. Each conversation is different. Each guest is unique. Each episode is a story with profound wisdom you may want to listen to more than once. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode. Okay, let's begin. Welcome back to part two of the frequency of the afterlife, my spirited, pun intended, conversation with Mark Anthony JD, the psychic lawyer. Let's pick up where we left off. You mentioned spiritual synchronicity. What's the difference between spiritual synchronicity and spiritual awareness, which you also talk about in your book? Now, these are two different concepts, but they both involve spirit communication. So could you speak to that for a moment? Spiritual situational awareness is being, um, okay, my dad was a Navy SEAL. So everything about him was be aware. And and let me tell you, in the United States, in this day and age, I am really glad I have the father that I did. Because you walk into a public place now, you need to be aware of what's going on in every direction. That's situational awareness. First responders, police, military, paramedics, they are they are very well skilled in being aware. And the problem that we have in our day and age is people are walking around, staring at their cell phone, um, earbuds in. I saw something funny on uh, social media recently. There's all these people sitting in a park, earbuds in, staring at their cell phones, and Bigfoot was walking by. And the caption read, this is why there's no current pictures of Bigfoot. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so, you know, we're all plugged into electronic true. devices and we're filled. <laughs> oh, so how true. Yeah, It is true. It is. And so, you know, we're all plugged in and distracted and electronic and, and all this. Um, get rid of all that stuff. Okay. You don't need to be plugged in all the time. Um, Be aware of what's going on around you. And spiritual situational awareness is now taking this not only from a 360 degree sphere around you, but it's extending it into being sensitive to the energetic frequencies emitted by electromagnetic souls, spirits. And so when you start picking up on the presence of spirits and you kind of get those tingly sensations that guide you to something or away from something, that spiritual synch- uh, that spiritual situational awareness spiritual synchronicity is as you develop your spiritual situational awareness you will then start being more sensitive to the presence of the messages from and the guidance of spirits which are synchronistic um my raft technique and i i could go into that if you'd like um mm-hmm. Uh, explains that the raft technique is something that's in my book the afterlife frequency it's one of the lessons that i teach and what was happening anna is i was i was working on the manuscript for the book and i hit the dreaded writer's block boom and you know the problem with writer's block for everyone who's out there out there who's a writer or even if you're in school or college and It always happens when you schedule the entire day just to work on it. (laughs) It it always seems like when I have no time and something's coming up, an interview or a project or something, oh, then I get ideas. So nothing. So I figured, all right, I'm going to go for a walk um, on the beach. So I start heading down my driveway um, and I get these cold chills and tingles. And I realize, okay, electromagnetic energy 
and I'm being directed in the opposite direction toward a bike path. So I'm walking on this bike path. It's about midday. And suddenly, Anna, I see these two objects shining in the light. And I walk up to them. And it's a nickel and a penny. And so for our Australian friends who may not be familiar, a nickel is a five cent piece and a penny is a one cent piece. And the funny thing is, I'm going to pick them up and I hear my mother's voice in spirit say, if they're face down, it's bad luck. And I start cracking up because my mom's side of the family is of Italian descent and the Italians have a superstition for all occasions. All right. I mean, it's like we could even on the other side. Well, it, it was her personality. And then I hear my dad's voice, uh -huh. and he was from Pennsylvania. His family was white, Anglo Saxon, Protestant, and they were Baptist. I hear him say, It's money, grab it. So I'm laughing because this is my, you know, I'm feeling my parents and I'm holding in the palm of my hand a nickel and a penny. And all of a sudden I go, Oh, six cents. And then I say, Six sense. Okay. 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 I'll go, mom and dad, what are you trying to tell me? Cold chills, tingles enveloped my body. Now, many people, when something like this happens and they think there's a spirit around, they think it's evil. Why? Because this is the same physiological response in fight or fight phenomenon. In other words, when you're terrified and you get those cold chills and tingles, but when you start working with this, you can begin to distinguish. There was nothing here to be afraid of. I said, Mom, Dad, what are you trying to tell me? And then in my mind's eye, I saw my dad a remind, standing in the ocean holding this blue canvas raft that we had when I was a kid. We used to you know, ride waves on it and all this. Mm -hmm. And my dad had been a Navy SEAL. Um, he was a scuba diver. And he used to teach as um, uh, children how to swim at the YMCA. He was a swimming instructor. And all of a sudden, I heard my parents in unison teach people, recognize signs from spirits, accept the concept is real, feel it without overthinking, trust the message. I go, R-A-F-T, raft. And I ran home and then writer's block was over and the words just flew out of me. And so I think about what, what did my parents do? They ran me through the raft technique. I had the, the writer's block for a reason. All of a sudden, they maneuvered me. My spiritual situational awareness led to a situation of spiritual synchronicity. The sixth sense led to me teaching people to recognize signs from spirits, the cold chills, accept the contact is real when I heard them. Feel without overthinking. Now, this is where most people go wrong. You torpedo the message there. Oh, this is a coincidence. It's a hallucination. Oh, this can't be. This is impossible. This is where most people go wrong. They hyperanalyze the, the contact away, and then it fizzles out. And so you get through that, and then you trust the message. And in the, my book, The Afterlife Frequency, I give exercises on how to start getting rid of that block. And when you start using the raft technique, even if you're not a medium or a psychic, you're going to be more attuned to these experiences. And, and so that is, is how spiritual situational awareness led to spiritual synchronicity. Mm, wonderful. I'm glad that you mentioned and that you were talking about chills and, and tingles in the body, which is a physical body sensation. I am quite intuitive myself, and I I can sense energy, I can sense spirit, and my perception of the spirit around me is precisely chills and tingles in my body. And it often happens when I, uh, even in my sessions with clients, because I, I get a lot of, you know, download information, what to say, how to say, how to run the session. When I get with these chills, like I'm getting actually now goosebumps and chills, when I'm getting chills and, and goosebumps, it's a signal, it's a sign that the spirit, uh, if you like, endorses what I am saying, that yes, this is exactly what, 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 we, are, uh, what we are telling you. So, uh, so this is a, a confirmation for me and, you know, in many other situations. So, yes, I, I, I completely agree with you and I'm glad that you mentioned this for people to pay attention to those bodily sensations, which are not connected to any other external influences, obviously. And just on, on a funny side, 
to add quickly, I do have, as I said, I'm intuitive and I have fairly good relationship with my higher self, if you like, or intuition or, or the spirit. And I quite often hear in my mind guidance. And it was so funny. The other day I was in the shops and I was buying a few things and there were two items quite similar, but, you know, still different. And I decided to get both of them and I put one in the basket and then I reached out for the second one and I heard in my in my mind, now don't buy this one, you won't need it. I said, okay. <laughs> and I didn't. And then as I was going to the checkout, I realized that yes, when I thought about it logically, that was the right advice because I would not use this item. So it would be just, and I would spend the money for nothing. So I guess intuitively, when I now think about it, I intuitively followed your rough tr strategy. Exactly. It, yeah. Accept it, then act on it if appropriate, and then think about it and analyze it later on. Because, you know, I mean, it was a small thing. Just don't buy this because you, you won't use it. But I said, okay, and I didn't. <laughs> right. But, yeah, but, but don't ever minimalize that it was a small thing because that was legitimate use of the raft technique and spirit communication because once you get proficient at the the quote unquote smaller messages then those lead to the more complex messages and and so yes you you did gave a perfect example of the application of the raft technique i want to focus on the last step of it trust we live in well you know people say we live in in uh, bad times Ex excuse me but when has planet earth ever been the republic of kumbaya OK, was it during the Roman Empire? Not so much. Was it during the Mongol invasion of Asia? I'm not thinking that. The Crusades, definitely not. World War I and II, you know, not so much. OK, humanity's always been, you know, uh, hell on earth, for lack of a better term. But we live in a time when people say that they're receiving messages from their version of God to go commit acts of terrorism, anger, bigotry, hatred, and violence. And, and it, was a, it was given to me by God. No, it wasn't. It was given to them by the ego, which is created by the brain, not the spirit. And the ego can also be thought of as edging God out. And you know the difference between an ego-based message versus a message from spirits a message from the divine, because messages from spirits are always about peace, love, healing, protection, and resolution. Messages that involve anger, bigotry, hatred, and violence are never spiritual messages. And, and it's important for people to understand the difference. So when you see these, you know, weirdos that want to blow up uh, buildings and, uh, uh, you know, murder children in the name of their God. No, it's in the name of their ego, which is not, ha has nothing to do with the spiritual. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, you're right. Absolutely right. The discernment is very important. And by the way, that example that I gave, uh, that happened before I read your book and, and you know, about the rough, your, your rough technique. So, but when I read about it, yeah. I just thought, okay, so I, I'm intuitively doing what you are teaching. <laughs> so, uh... Very good. See, exactly. Well, exactly, because I've had a number of people say, you know, I've been doing that. And then other people have, have, have uh, contacted me and said, I started mm. doing this and it really works. And what I always tell people, um, a lot of folks come into a spirit communication session or they say, like, um, my loved one died. They never come to through to me. Why, why, why? You know, I say, well, hold on. When you go into spirit communication with I want, I want, I want demanding you're flooding the energetic field with angst and you don't mean to. And I certainly understand when, when someone you love dies, there's this absolute need and want for that contact, but inadvertently that angst is creating a block. And so that's why I always recommend wait three to, to six months after the passing of a loved one, the spirit can communicate right away. But even though you think you want the contact, 
let's say I'm facilitating communication and you're hysterical or you're so angry. So you're not listening. You're and also you're creating an energetic block. So after a couple months, the emotions stabilize to where then you'll be able to receive the maximum benefit of the communication. So that's why people um, that that do what I do always, um, you know, the legitimate mediums, we say, wait, you know, anywhere from three to, to, to six months. Uh, so that gives you a chance to get to the point where you're going to be more receptive. Mm, yes, absolutely. Is mediumship reading a one-way information flow from the spirit through you or through the medium to the client? Or can people ask questions? And if yes, does the spirit hear them? Or do you need to put the question to the spirit via your own channels? Think of spirit communication as a triangle. And at the top of the triangle is the afterlife frequency, the spirits. The medium's at one, one base of the triangle and the client's at the other base. So it's a three-way communication. Spirits will transmit messages to me. Um, I'll see things, hear things, feel things, know things, taste things, smell things. And I'll um, present that to the recipient. And if the recipient avoids the no, no, no syndrome where everything's no, 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 or overthink, 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 hyperanalyze, hyperanalyze, um, or the, the super negative objections. And that's a chapter in the afterlife frequency called avoiding the no, no, no syndrome and how to get that. Then there is a three-way communication. Spirits can always hear you. So if you need to say to somebody, I love you, just say it. They'll, they'll hear you. And I explain how that works through frequency beacons and how they pick up on on uh, what what you're feeling because feelings uh, and thoughts are electromagnetic impulses. Once again, we're back to uh, quantum entanglement and electromagnetic energy. But what I tell people during readings is there are times that spirits will open up for questions. And when you give a question, keep them shorter, like 10 words or less, because some people come up with this immense fact pattern. Well, then there was this, and da, 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 da. it's like, you got to realize we're communicating with another dimension. This isn't <laughs> Alexa or Siri or, you know, Google or, you know, whatever, um, yeah. you know, we're, we're putting out a message and we get, get a response. Yeah. Um, something I think would, would, would be relevant uh, to, to, to this discussion. I was doing a reading for this woman. And her mother's spirit came through and started talking about um, a seven-year-old boy in this world connected to her with issues with his eyesight. And she said, well, I don't have um, any children, but my sister, whom I'm very close with, and her seven-year-old son, whom I love very much, um, her son's been complaining about headaches and blurred vision recently. I said, your mother said that you've got to get him to the eye doctor. Now, anyone hearing this will say, well, of course, you know. But then I said, now your mother, I'm hearing tutti fruity, ah, Rudy, tutti fruity, ah, Rudy. I said, by little Richard, you know, uh, that old 50 song. And the woman says, well, that doesn't make any sense to mm -hmm. me. She goes, I know who little Richard is or was, but uh, that doesn't ring a bell with me at all. I said, look, this is what the spirit is giving me. Um, so I'm going to leave that with you. Okay, so a couple weeks later, Anna, I get an email and the lady said, Mark, you're not going to believe this. <laughs> and I always love when I hear that because, hello, welcome to my world. She said, I called my sister and told her about the reading. And she said, yeah, he, um, my son said that the headaches and, and all that are getting worse. So I'm going to make an appointment uh, to the eye doctor right away. She said, so then about two weeks after that, my sister, uh, she goes, I went with them and the seven-year-old, my seven-year-old nephew, we went to the eye doctor. And the second we walked into the doctor's office on the radio, it started playing Tutti Frutti, Ah Rudy by Little Richard. All right. Here's what was going on. The mother is electromagnetic as an electromagnetic soul. And they're able to do a quick scan of our bodies and they find um, energetic anomalies within our body. That's how spirits are able to determine um, medical conditions. This woman's grandson was having issues with the eye, and she said, you get him to the doctor, and to prove to you that you're doing the right thing, because she's pure EM energy, she was able to pick up on a future event, ergo Einstein's theory of relativity, there's no time on the subatomic quantum level, she was able to pick up 
the radio waves of an event in what we call the future. And guess what? Radio waves are also electromagnetic energy. So there's a lot more going on here when you start analyzing mm-hmm. it than just, oh, isn't it neat that that song was playing? That was the grandmother, the mother spirit, validating that they were indeed in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. Yes, absolutely. Can you request contact with specific souls, for example, Princess Diana, and ask her whether her death was accidental or not? As many people were speculating, can we do this? They were asking psychics, you know, can you do this? Because obviously there was such an interest. Is it possible or can you do this or you would not do this for various reasons? It generally requires a direct connection. Somebody that I'm doing the reading for to have a direct connection with that person. And if we got just a few minutes, um, I think I have a story that will answer your question. Um, A few years ago, uh, I was in Buffalo, New York, and I was on a speaking tour and my manager was on the phone and she said, what, when, now? She goes, Mark, uh, movie star Shirley MacLaine, her assistant's on the phone and Shirley MacLaine wants to interview you on her radio show. I said, when? She said, now. I go, now? <laughs> and, and so she gives me the phone and they go, stand by for Miss McLean. And, and for those of you who don't know, Shirley MacLaine is a spiritual icon. First major celebrity back in the um, 80s, yeah. 1980s, she wrote a book called Out on a Limb, set forth her beliefs in reincarnation, psychic phenomena, spirit communication. And of course, she yeah. she won an Academy Award. And so, so I was supposed to be on for 20 minutes, but at the end of 20 minutes, Ms. McLean said, Mark, I'm enjoying this so much. Do you mind if we go longer? And I'm like, well, yeah. We were on the phone for two hours and 40 minutes, and all this was on air. It's all recorded, all right? So throughout the course of the uh, discussion, um, she, she, Stephen Hawking, the physicist, was alive at the time. She said, well, Stephen's a friend of mine, and I was in his office, mm-hmm. and on the wall behind him were two pictures, one of Albert Einstein and one of Marilyn Monroe. And I said, Stephen, I get Einstein, but why Marilyn Monroe? And then she imitates Stephen Hawking's voice. She goes, because her curves are more beautiful than a quantum <laughs> singularity. And so I'm laughing. And I said, well, I said, um, wow, um, Marilyn Monroe, did you know her? And she goes, yes, Mark. She was a good friend of mine. And I said, um, and she said that what happened back in the late 1950s is that the movie studios used to play us she's this is her talking against each other they would threaten Marilyn with parts I was up for and vice versa and she goes and it was nasty in fact she said and Shirley McLean was part of what was known as the Rat Pack Frank Sinatra Dean Martin um uh Sammy Davis Jr Joey Bishop Peter Lawford and Shirley McLean and and I said, oh, you're part of the Rat Pack. Did you ever meet JFK? She goes, oh, him. <laughs> and I'm like, wow. So she's uh, she met President John F. Kennedy. She goes, not only that. She goes, I was with the Rat Pack the night that Marilyn Monroe sang happy birthday to John F. Kennedy. But backstage, Marilyn threw a fit and said, I'm not wearing that dress. And if anyone's seen that, um, that footage, she was wearing this sparkly, almost see-through dress. And one of the producers said, no problem. Shirley McLean's in the audience. She's your size. She can wear that dress. And so Marilyn said, fine, I'll do it. All right. So she goes out and then she sings happy birthday. You know, we've all, you know, probably heard that. She sings happy birthday. And I said, wow, that's really amazing. And she said, and things changed, Mark, when, when I got the role in the movie, The Apartment. And that was a huge, huge uh, part for Shirley MacLaine. And it catapulted her from being you know, part of the Rat Pack and kind of a B-list actress to now a major celebrity. And she said, so there we were at Grumman's Chinese Theater in Hollywood, the red carpet premiere of, of the, the apartment. And uh, Marilyn shows up, steps out of a limo, and she's wearing a full length fur coat. And everybody, she said, was going, what is up with Maryland? It's, you know, it's L.A., it's Los Angeles, it's like 100 degrees. It's really hot. Why is she wearing a fur coat? And she said, 
during the movie, Marilyn got up and went out to the bar and Shirley went out there and said, Marilyn, is there a problem? And what's what's wrong? And, and Shirley McLean said, now, now, mind you, we're on air. She goes, Marilyn opened up her fur coat and was stark naked underneath it. <laughs> and then Shirley McLean says, now that I think about it, Stephen Hawking had a point. <laughs> so, so I'm like, well, I'm talking to somebody who saw Marilyn Monroe naked and I'm like laughing. And I go, wow, I wonder what Marilyn would think of that. She goes, well, you're the medium. You tell me. And I'm like, uh oh, I mean, and, and it's like, talk about pressure. Here is a major metaphysical celebrity who really knows this stuff. And I said, OK, and I'm, and I'm trying to calm myself. And, you know, I, I you know, breathe in, uh, exhale. And I opened up the frequency. And lo and behold, Marilyn's spirit comes through. And Shirley said, was she murdered? Ask Marilyn was she murdered, implying the Kennedy family had something to do with it? And the response was, no, I just couldn't take it anymore. She said, surely you would glide through a crowd with such grace and elegance, yet I felt garish, and I couldn't stand the way everybody was staring at me and talking about me and criticizing me. I just couldn't take it anymore. And Shirley goes, I see. And then the next message came. She said, I want to thank you, Shirley, for taking the high road and not doing it. And I didn't know what that meant. And Shirley McLean says, I know exactly what that means. And I've been worried and not worried, wondering about that for decades. She said, Mark, when Marilyn died, she said, the studios, true to form, came right to me and said, well, we were working on a picture with Marilyn. And how about we cut all the scenes with her in it out, reshoot them with you, and we'll just, you know, cast you in the movie. And Shirley said, no, I'm not doing that to my friend. I'm taking the high road. Mm. And then I said, there's another spirit that wants to acknowledge you. She's so beautiful. Um, a brunette with these like violet eyes. And before I could say anything, Shirley goes, Liz. Oh, Liz Taylor was my dearest friend. She took me under her wing when we were in, when I came to Hollywood. And Anna, at that moment, it dawned on me. I was doing a reading for Shirley McLean while I was communicating with the spirits of Marilyn Monroe and Elizabeth Taylor. And I don't know if I'm ever going to top that one. Wow. Yes. Wow. Amazing story. Well, Mark, before we talk about your book, I have one more slightly hairy question. Hairy questions are my specialties, by the way. When we make a choice, whether it's um, what to have for lunch and which cafe to go to, to where to go on holidays, as we say here in Oz, or on vacation, as you say, to where to relocate to another country and which one... Do we exercise our free will at that decision point or is our choice already predetermined, giving us just an illusion of free will? Do we have free will at all? Absolutely. And the answer to the question is all the above. Think of our life. We have there's a day we're coming out in and a day we're going out. And what we have free will over is what we do in between. There are certain people, certain events that we're going to have to encounter and endure. And uh, in the 15,000 plus readings that I've conducted, spirits keep repeating this. And so, so what I tell people, particularly when a spirit comes through or a group of spirits and gives somebody health advice, and I always tell them, run everything through your doctor. But let's say they tell the person, start changing your eating habits, get exercise, do this, because they'll come through and many times they get very specific diagnoses and very specific things that you should be doing. Well, let's say that you don't do that. 
all right, and you're supposed to live to be 85 years old, all right, so there's a day you're going out, but 10 years or 15 years before that, you you don't change your health habits, like the spirit said, and you get a massive stroke and you're paralyzed, you can't walk or talk or even go to the bathroom on your own, and then you die on the same day you would have. Now, what if you change your health habits, you die on the same day, but you have a higher quality of life or mobile and able to function perfectly right up until the day you go to sleep and don't wake up. And so so free will is 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 both is there are certain things you're going to have to go through. And so when they come through and they start telling you, like, take your grandson, my grandson to the eye doctor or stop eating this or doing. I mean, I've had uh, spirits come through. And um, I remember I was doing a reading for this guy and um, his mother, father, brother, sister came through and they had all died of lung cancer because I could feel it. And they said, you've got to stop smoking, got to stop smoking. And he goes, huh? He goes, well, he goes, I like smoking too much. And I said, all right, your father, mother, sister, brother all died of lung cancer. They came all the way from heaven to tell you to stop smoking because you too will get lung cancer. I said, I think I'd take that very seriously. He goes, well, I don't know about that. I go, well, that's up to you. Um, I realize addictions are addictions. However, you have free will whether to succumb to the addiction or to um, resist it. And there's a lot of people saying, well, it's a disease. Well, it may be, but it's a different type of disease. Like you can't just decide to stop having lung cancer, but you can decide to stop doing the things which will give it to you. The choice is yours. So free will is a very, very complex thing. Um, and in, you know, in my lectures on reincarnation, where I talk about karma, and also in the afterlife frequency, evidence of eternity, um, my, you know, my books and uh, never letting go, I talk about uh, karma as well. Think about the teachings of all the great belief systems, all the great spiritual teachers. You can boil it down into two words. Be nice. Treat people with respect. Treat people with kindness. And that's not always easy. It's a lot, a lot harder said than, I mean, uh, done than said. But let's generate positive karma. Yes. Yeah, so what you just said, we could put it in a, in a different way. Basically that, yes, we do have destiny, which is a blueprint for our life. But how we complete this destiny, we have free will to go through it via different pathways, if you like. And so we do have decision points along the way, which are our free will. So even those decisions, yes, will I stop smoking or I will not stop smoking? That is not predetermined. This is left up to us with a, against the um the the blueprint which says you know you will end this life at 85 but how you will live those 85 years it is up to you and i guess there might be some other what i call non-negotiables in your destiny that you can't change for various karmic and and so pathways reasons but other than that we there is a margin of free will of literal pure free will because otherwise we wouldn't grow as a soul as a human as a soul because if everything was absolutely predetermined then we would just say okay we we get reincarnated we go through life go through step a b c d until i get to the end of, of my life and then i go to the next one well what's the point if there were no decisions driven by our free will and learning from our mistakes, then there would be no environment for our soul to learn or for us to learn and grow and develop because we would just be going on automatic pretty much through the blueprint of our destiny. I couldn't agree more. That That is so beautifully put, Anna. Um that's why I always tell people, be nice, take care of yourself. You know, we're given a body, whether you love it or hate it, that's where you're living until your EMS leaves. Mm. And, you know, health is such, such a beautiful gift. 
when you're healthy, you have a thousand wishes. When you're not, you have one. Yes. Very true. Very true. Let's talk about your book, The Afterlight Frequency. What is its genesis, the key message or messages, and the objectives, if you could summarize for us? And by the way, obviously, I will include all the links in the show notes so people, and I really, really highly recommend this book and, and your other books, which I haven't read yet, but this one that I have, it is such a pleasure to read, and it's so full of very important information. So I absolutely recommend. But if you would, Mark, just as an overview or as a nutshell, uh, how did you come up with this idea? Uh, what are the key messages of the book and its objectives? Just as a teaser. I, I, yeah, there, there's that's it's such a long answer, <laughs> long uh, teaser uh, to that. <laughs> it, it it really is. Um, well, my first book, Never Letting Go, I wrote as a guide on the journey through grief, and it's recommended by hospices and healthcare workers around the world. And when I was on the Never Letting Go book tour, people used to ask me questions about, you know, do animals have souls? Is reincarnation real? Is there a heaven? Is there a hell? Does God exist? Um, my son died by suicide. Did he go? Did he go to hell? And so I started compiling those questions, and it led me to write Evidence of Eternity, which is bridging the gap between the spiritual and the scientific. And Evan, in both my my books, uh, were uh, so I'm so humbled and, and honored at how well they were received. And in fact, Evidence of Eternity um, was also considered for a Pulitzer Prize, and in both books uh, won awards. And I saw that. People wanted to know more about the science of spirituality. Can we prove this? And I started thinking that what would be the book that if I wanted to know about this, if I wanted proof, what would be the book I would want to read? And that is only part of what led me to write The Afterlife Frequency. And the electromagnetic soul came to me, the raft technique, the spirit, it's, 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 they all started coming together. And granted, it took me between the research and the writing roughly five years uh, to write the wow. book. But you have to keep in mind that during all of it, there was a lot going on in my life. I, you know, I was on speaking tours. And then my father developed cancer. And, and uh, you know, I was one of his caretakers. And but all those experiences were were lending towards what had happened. And when you said the Genesis, the my best friend um, that I ever had was Billy, and he's in both Evidence of Eternity and in the Afterlife Frequency. In fact, he's in Chapter One of the Afterlife yeah. Frequency. And I'm not going to tell because <laughs> that's a that 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 was just some uh, really exciting uh, story, but. Billy and I met when we were 11 years old. We were the best of friends. It's like I was always at his house. He was always at my house. We went to junior high school, high school, college uh, together. And then after college, he went to Asia to teach people um, English. Uh, and he he had a gift for languages. He spoke Japanese, Thai, Indonesian, some Cantonese. Um, and we had all these adventures together in, in Asia when, when I went to visit him. And our entire life, we'd both been raised Catholic. He was Irish Catholic. I'm Italian Catholic, but he was an atheist. And he said, well, there's no technology that can prove this. There's no science that can, can prove this. But especially when we were, we were in Asia and he would see me interacting with Buddhist monks because I wanted to learn. And, and he was always very respectful of that. He said, but you got me thinking. He said, but I don't, I still don't believe. Well, a couple of years after that, and he was the best friend. He met this amazing woman from Japan, and they asked me to perform their wedding ceremony because at the time I was a notary public in addition to, to being an attorney. And you know, Anna, this was one of the best days of my life. Sorry, I'm getting choked up here. I was standing on, on the, the platform and there's my best friend in a tuxedo and my new best friend, his, his soon-to-be wife. Uh, she was just so beautiful. And everyone that I loved was there. My parents, his parents, my siblings, 
all of our friends, all my fraternity brothers, everybody that that meant something to me. It was one of those shining moments in life. And I got to marry my best friend or perform the ceremony to to his his beautiful wife. And unfortunately, Billy had been plagued with with depression his whole life. And three years later, he died from suicide. And obviously, I was devastated. And not long after that, um, my book, Never Letting Go, came out. And I was in Colorado at the Stanley Hotel at a paranormal conference. I was one of the the keynotes. And in the conference room, after my um, presentation, there were several tables set up. And I was there, and I was signing copies of Never Letting Go. And my manager, Rocky, she was uh, with me and she was walking around looking at some of the other displays. And there was a bunch of people there from the TV shows that are ghost hunters and and paranormal investigators. So she's walking by this one table and the the guy uh, there, his name is Chris, and he was demonstrating what's known as the spirit box. And it's supposed to pick up on voices of spirits. And she walks by and all of a sudden she hears, get Mark. And Rocky stopped and looked at it. And Chris said, did that thing just talk to you? And it, and, and it said, get Mark. And all of a sudden I hear, Mark, Mark. And I look up and, and they're waving at me. Get over here. Get over here now. And so I knew something was up. And, and I get up and I run over. And as I'm running up to, to the table, all of a sudden I hear, dude. And, my, and, 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 and Anna, cold chills, tingles. I knew that voice and I looked at Rocky and a tear was coming out of her eyes. And before I could say anything else, the voice came out of the box said, love you, bro. And she goes, Mark, Mark. She goes, that was Billy's voice. And I go, I know it was. And, and I was getting all like choked up and there's a whole crowd of people around. And and, uh, Chris said, this is highly unusual. Not only did it ask for you by name, you both positively identified the voice of the spirit. Sometimes we only get a word or two. And and I remember the last thing he ever said to me in this world, he hugged me because he had to go back to to California. Uh, Actually, he was going to Japan. He says, I love you, bro, was the last thing he ever said to me. And then later on, Anna, I sat down. I said, now I understand the atheist, the atheist spirit came through to me and used technology to communicate with me. And he's the one that said, there's no science to prove this, and there's no technology to prove this. And that launched me into researching frequency, quantum physics, all the aspects in the science, which led to the afterlife frequency. I just got goosebumps and chills. What a story. What a beautiful, beautiful story. Thank you so much for sharing. Now I'm getting teary. Ah, what a beautiful story. Thank you, Mark, so much for this. My final question is, if you were granted three wishes by a genie, anything at all, you want anything for yourself or for others, what would they be? And I'll give you a moment to think about it. Three wishes, anything at all, no boundaries. That's such a fascinating question. I think I would like the ability to heal myself and others. And you got to be careful because I've watched enough of these type of science fiction and fantasy shows because by saying that, you may end up yourself being a genie. (laughs) Okay, so it would come with the, you know, being a lawyer, I'd put a writer on there. But that doesn't mean I'm a genie (laughs) because truly health is the greatest gift of all. Um, But you'd have to be very careful. And the caveat there would be that I couldn't tell anybody that I could do this, because if you did, then then that that um, wish would come become a curse because there'd be I'd be thronged with people constantly wanting there to be cures. So I think what I I'd, I'd probably rather do 
is wish for there to be cellular regeneration that could cure cancer, neurological, all types of diseases, um, and that it would be readily available for everybody. So I think that would be better than, you know, I have this power because I certainly would not want to become some sort of, you know, um, you know, messianic uh, figure. Secondly, I mean, certainly um, I would like there to be clean energy. And I don't want to get into the whole, oh, you're woke and you're, you know, some leftist or something like this. But I have been um, in Alaska at the Mendenhall Glacier. I've observed the um, scientific data where they take pictures and the, the studies that they've done for over 100 years to see how the glaciers are receding. And I realize that Earth goes through cycles of, of um, ice ages and warm ages. But also, I mean, think about, I mean, the, the polluting effects of fossil fuels, the air quality, um, the deforestation. I've seen it in the Amazon um, up, up close, and it's just heart-wrenching. So I'd like there to be some type of clean energy. And, of course, peace. Now, what's funny about that, I remember on, there was a show some years ago called The X-Files. Yeah. And it was about these two FBI agents that, you <laughs> yeah. know, and Agent Mulder found a genie and he said, I want there to be, he goes, I want there to be world peace. And she goes, oh, how arrogant of you. Jesus couldn't do it. Buddha couldn't do it. Muhammad couldn't do it. But you think you can? He goes, well, I want there to be world peace. She goes, okay. And also he goes, wow, it's awfully quiet here. And he opens up the office and there's nobody there. He looks, he goes, where'd everybody go? She goes, I got rid of everybody in the world. It's very peaceful now. He said, What? And then there was an episode of The Simpsons cartoon where, where Lisa gets a wish and she wishes for world peace and everybody's singing, oh, you know, they're all singing world peace. And now aliens are watching and they go, ah, Earth is now defenseless. You know, so, <laughs> so, you know, we always have to be careful. Um, and I remember also that that comedy from the 1960s, I Dream a Genie. Yeah where Jeannie gives a wish to Major Healy or, or something, and he says, I could end a war. And she said, by ending one war, you may start 10 others. By flooding the Sahara, you could drain an ocean. Yeah. So it would be very difficult to say what these wishes are. I mean, you know, yeah, tons of money, fame, this, that, yeah. and the other thing doesn't necessarily mean that's going to bring you happiness. I, I would like things more on a global level. Um, maybe the desire of human beings to conquer and subjugate each other. Maybe that would be nice to get rid of. Um, so, so it's a complex question, and my answers are indeed complex and and maybe incomplete. But that's that's going to have to do for now. Well, it's thank you, beautiful answer, very unusual, but very profound because you are absolutely right. Everything has its flip side when you think about it. So you are very right that when we are making a wish about anything, whatever, it pays to think about the flip side of that wish or its potential consequences because everything is connected. You know, you, you sneeze in Japan and fruit falls off the tree in California. So your answer to my question, which is on surface, it's a very simple question. You know, what would you like if I granted you three wishes? But the way you replied is really a lot of food for thought. And I feel it actually beautifully encapsulates this whole conversation in the sense that there are simple concepts easy to understand on the surface that we can deal with, but they are much, much more complex and going to the levels we cannot simply comprehend. And we have to be okay with that because our mind's ability is finite, although it grows and... and um, science develops and everything else. But we need to accept that there are things out there 
that escape our explanation and we will never understand in this lifetime, in this form. And that's okay. So thank you so much for that. It was really, really beautiful conversation. We could be going on probably for another three hours. <laughs> Any final message or thought you would like to share with our audience before we close? People ask me oftentimes, well, if, if you just what you asked me, if I have a message, and once again, this is a very long story, so I'll just give you the, the message. It has been conveyed to me actually um, by, by spirits, by my mother's spirit speaking on behalf of the collective, that my mission in this life is to help people understand that the divine power that we call God, and I don't mean a neurotic white guy sitting on a throne with a scepter, okay, but something, you know, this, this pervasive energy and intelligence, which is much greater than ourselves, exists, that the afterlife heaven, nirvana, happy valley, uh, uh, the afterlife frequency, whatever you want to call it, exists, that our electromagnetic souls are, are um, eternal living beings, that we can communicate with souls, and that we will be reunited with our loved ones when it is our appointed time to leave the material world and transition into the light that we call God. Mm, beautiful. So beautifully said. Well, Mark, thank you so much for this amazing conversation. It's been such a pleasure to have you on my show. Thank you very much. And um, Anna, it's been an on it's been an honor to be here and to to speak uh, to your audience. And for everyone listening, may God bless you. Thank you. God bless. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well.